uh, it's been in the West Coast for a long time recently, so I'm like, I don't know where I'm at. In fact, we, did, we thought it was Wednesday in the month of today. So everybody got a food? <coughs> I, feel, I feel bad for y'all. Your tax is going to be old. There's, a, there's actually a chair up here. Yeah. <laughs> Unit testing with Pester? Folks heard of Pester before? A few people? Quite a few people. Alright. You using it or just like kind of what you No one wants to volunteer. Alright. More alcohol is required. Uh, so cool. Well, that was a cool animation thing I did because I hate PowerPoint. So, so this is kind of cool. Uh, so it's a pleasure to meet all y'all. Uh, I live in Texas for quite some time. You have to excuse the y'alls. Um, basically, I run a company called walnutwork.com. I work for Rubric, but that's my blog and where I write videos and things like that. Uh, and I also co host a podcast called The Data Knots, which is like astronauts with data, because like data center. Uh, we release a show every Wednesday. It's focused on data centers in the cloud, and we talk to folks like you about what they're doing and really how we're busting down silos so that you know not everyone hates the network people anymore. And other things. And these jokes are just <laughs> more beer is required. Uh, from a PowerShell perspective, like, oh, why do you trust this guy? Uh, I've been writing PowerShell since around 2009 uh, as part of my exchange life. Uh, exchange um, so I've been writing code with this particular language for quite some time. And recently, Microsoft's like, you're an MVP of PowerShell. I'm like, okay. Uh, <laughs> so I've been doing that for just over a year. And as Mike said, uh, I will keep the market texture out of here. We're not going to talk about rubric stuff. I got the shirt on, except I'm fine if I'm not here because I'll be writing code. So I'm not. I'm not trying to like hide from y'all. It's just literally, I gotta be the DJ. This is a really insane place to like present. Yo, I guess you got the headset on. <laughs> okay, so no, no selling. It's just gonna be nerdy and deep and techy. Feel free to interrupt at any time. I don't care about that. And for the most part, I'd like to actually show live examples and go through code. Is that okay with y'all? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we'll be switching out of the PowerPoint periodically, which <coughs> makes me happy. Not to leave that. So realistically, I put this together because I feel like so much <laughs> content in the world is like this. And you read some blog posts like unit testing, that sounds cool. And they're like, yeah, here's the intro, and then here's the finished product. And like, what about all that cool stuff in the middle? Like, how do I get from number four to number five? And no one really tells you that. They just assume that you can, you know, in, uh, infer all of that from their environment. So I don't necessarily think that you're going to walk away today and be a tester pro, or that you're going to totally be on board with unit testing and have it down to the wire as to what exactly it does. But I want to get your mind thinking a little bit about that it's important, that it's something you should invest your time into, because it makes life easier and better, things like that. And that you'll at least have all the ammunition required. I'll give you some books, some people to follow, some resources on the web, to really kind of help yourself kickstart that process. Because there's no way I can get unit testing in roughly an hour. Does that sound fair? You're, you're here for that? That's good? Okay, good. Uh, cool. So, Pester, weird name, right? What, what does it do? Basically, I listed it like this way. Uh, these are the reasons you'd want to invest in Pester. And I, hopefully, it resonates with you in some way, shape, or form. The first one's like, yeah, you've got scripts, right? Go on scripts, you write power call it some way. Otherwise, why are you here? That's weird. Uh, so, you've got some scripts somewhere, and usually you require other people to like bug test those. Maybe that's you. Uh, and maybe that's you're sadistic and you just like that. But there's better ways, you know. I, I call I have I have a call out there. Meat spatulas at your hands, right? They're not a very good debugging tool. They only work so fast, and you only have two of them. And you'd probably rather have one hand on a growler and the other one on a pizza, not debugging code. Uh, so hey, you can't test everything uh, with your meat spatulas. And, uh, my most important item there: you want to automate stuff to avoid more work. So if I could, I would retire now and just never work again, and just like fish and drink beer. I think that's that's a, that's my life goal. It's not the word. So this helps you do that. Uh, you don't have to necessarily tell your boss and be like, oh, it's going to be an hour to do that. It only takes a minute because you have to automate it. And you spend 59 minutes not working. I'm trying to give you back your lunch time. So how does Pester help with that? At a high level, this is what Pester does. Sorry, I feel so boxed in about you. These four things, right? So you write some unit tests, and unit test is a really fancy way of saying test the logic within my script. Or my code. I tend to just call them functions because I don't really write scripts anymore. But you know, within your code, I want to test the logic. If you expect it to go down this particular path, and these logic, you know, if and test, else, and those things to be respected through a certain flow, we want to test that that actually happens. Which is contrasted to functional testing, where we're going to test against a live system to see are the results that I'm expecting to the live system actually being adhered to. Right? So unit testing is more just the logic within the code. Okay? And you'll be surprised how often you think. 
the code is going out a certain path, and it totally doesn't. Right? And this will help you find that, find that out. Right? So Pester is a framework that's used to do those tests. <coughs> it's just a way to take a lot of stuff that we as PowerShell admins used to build ourselves. We made a framework out of it, and we made it available to everybody. Uh, the test has to fail, it's very binary, right? It either didn't work or it didn't. There's no gray area. You know, it's either binary. And the results are displayed. You decide what happens when you get the results. A little like a uh, cool thing, nicely because of the PowerShell uh, Summit, the Global Summit and DevOps Summit out in Bellevue. And uh, Jeffrey Stover was there, he's the inventor of PowerShell. And he's like, uh, yeah, actually, Pester is one of those cool projects that was built by the community. Microsoft didn't do it. And Microsoft themselves were having trouble writing a framework to do unit testing with the PowerShell because every language in the world has a unit testing framework except for PowerShell. It's kind of like and so uh, they're like, yeah, the, like the automation PowerShell team wanted to put it in Windows Server. And I don't know if you noticed that the Windows 10, this is, this is actually part of the initial. Uh, and the team was like, open source? What the hell is that? Like, no, there's no way that's going in a Microsoft product. They didn't even know like the definition of the term. And then they, uh, the Windows Server team, which is actually run by Jeffrey, saw Pester, and they're like, wow, this is really good. What do we have to pay to get this? He's like, open source. I don't think you understand how this works. And they actually embedded it into Windows Server, or uh, Windows Server in Windows Desktop version 10, <coughs> 2016, and 2012 um, And it was the catalyst that kicked Microsoft in the pants to start open source, uh, open sourcing their software and embracing things like Linux and running Oracle and, and or, sorry, uh, SQL and Linux and things like that. It was really what started their foray into open source. So, and those were just like random people that wanted to make a framework, and Microsoft said, cool, keep doing that, we like that, let's put it into Windows. Who doesn't that? You can change the world, even, even a big thing like Microsoft. <laughs> so the way I want to run this, oh man, it's hard if it's gray on the white. Uh, I will read it out. Because um, I'm going to go through an example first. I'm not telling you what's going on. I'm just going to walk through an example so you can see it, and then we'll dissect what's going on. And we'll do a bunch of more examples. But I just figured, rather than rambling on for a while, let's just go through the one and we'll dissect what's going on. So let's take something very logical. Let's say you have a function or a script. It really doesn't matter what it is. And if I give it an input of false, I expect to get back a return of false. Very logical, right? I get what I get. Um, so let's switch out to some code. And <coughs> go this up. Oh, wow. Is that big enough? <laughs> I'm trying to, actually, you know what? I'm going to just make it real quick that here's going to be here my monitor so that I can see it too. Because otherwise, I have to like pick up a storm. Apologies. Is that cool? Oh my yeah, there's that one. Still, oh my gosh, that's huge. I gotta make that a little bit smaller. Is that still really cool? How long can I go? Is that like is that good still? In the back? Close to the back? Okay. And I've got it in uh, like high contrast mode, that's why it looks all Tron like. By the way, for those curious, what the heck is this thing? It's called Visual Studio Code. It's a, you've heard of Visual Studio? You know, 37 gigabyte install that requires four hours and has like five kitchen sinks worth of features. This is not that. This is like L-Stripo refactored version, specifically written for not hardcore developers. It's written for awful people. So I love Visual Studio Code. I recommend using it. It's uh, not quite parity yet with PowerShell ISD. There's still some work to be done. But it's actually, this is mostly open source as well. The community is working on this. Uh, so let's say we have this function as an example here. And it's like this isn't a real function, I just want to show how it works. So we have a function called example one. This, you know, I don't like the name takes very expensive. Uh, where whatever I give it, you know, whatever input I give it is saved to dollar sign x. And this would be kind of a bug hiding in there. That even though I gave it, you know, in this case I'm going to give it a Boolean false, no matter what, it's going to return true, which would be my bug. Like, oh crap, I gave it false, I gave it true. And so then we can test that. Scroll down, I want to show you. Like this is behind the curtain. This is the wizard, and this is the actual wizard. So we can test that. We can use test here to essentially say, I want to run a test. I want to test the value of, of dollar sign x, and I want to see if dollar sign x is false. So I'm going to run this function, and I'm going to give it the boolean value of false, <coughs> and the return should be false. Like if you give it false, it should be back false. And if you run that, go to the bottom, <coughs> make this larger. There you go. You can see. Tester, uh, Pester does all of the heavy lifting. The angry red text that's probably hard to read because it's red on black. It's basically saying, I expected it to get false, I got true, therefore there's a bug in your code, you need to go fix this. So if someone had written that in the script, or you were up at like 3 in the morning, you fixed
to see something, you're like, oh crap, I'm just putting this in there to test something. This would be like, oh, you made a mistake. Here's exactly where it's at. Tell us the line number, et cetera. You can just go fix it. So that's like the result. And I'll give you more like real use cases. But this is the this is like your first date with Nestor. So it's very you just had drinks. <coughs> so it's about very excited. You sound very excited. I'm, I'm very convinced. Quite true. Quite true. I'm not so boring yet. That's okay. I can switch gears. I can dance. That was my backup slide, just in case. So what's actually happening? <laughs> the function's being evaluated because we're passing it a value. Right? We gave it false. Uh, the term is supposed to be true. Like, Pester's saying, okay, I'm going to look and see. Uh, or the term's supposed to be false. But it actually came back true. So Pester says, should be, that's an actual function that's being called by Pester. Compares the two values and said, well, they don't match to the test phase. Could you write that yourself? Probably. But why? It's already there for you. Right? Somebody's already done this uh, uh, framework for you. Does that make sense at a high level? And you're probably wondering, how the hell does that apply to me? Where does that have value? So let's dig deeper. Uh, first, I think it's something that's worthy to understand how to construct code for test here. Because it has kind of its own language, as you saw, describe and hit all these weird non, you know, kind of section functions. And usually it's verb dash noun. Right? So there's three layers or three buckets. You know, I guess test is like an onion, you know, it's got layers. So the describe block, the context block, and the hit block. That's just ways that you can logically group your tests for Pester. So the scribe block is like the, you know, a huge logical grouping of all your tests. You always have to use the describe block. And also anytime you do special definitions and scoping and mocking and things like that, other terminology that's used with Pester, it only lives within describe. So you can use that as a demarcation point between one set of tests and the next. Okay? So that none, of the, none of the inputs you use in one describe block can bleed over to the next. It's like a little firewall. Uh, and within that are child objects being context or int. I'll go into that. Context is a way that you can further slice up your tests. And I give you a couple examples here. Let's say you run some tests because you've written code that goes and deletes a user account out of AD after they've been let go or quit or whatever, right? But you don't want to just test that in production. Although well, you probably do. I, mean, I used to. But maybe you want to actually, actually test that. So you can test the code first in the context of a regular user to make sure it fails, and then test it again as an admin to make sure it succeeds. And so there's ways you can do context, which you're kind of running the same test in two different flavors, or multiple different flavors. Make sense? And then there's the it block, where you actually define the text. I've got a couple uh, example or pieces of advice here, because I started writing unit tests a couple years ago. And uh, I thought, like, okay, I just dive into this and kind of learn it. Apparently, there's like 30 plus years of unit testing knowledge out there that I totally ignored. Um, and did things totally wrong, and then about a year ago, I'm like, oh, this is really hard, why am I doing this wrong? And I read some material, I'm like, oh, okay, maybe I should pass those along. So the it block is really uh, where you specifically to say, run this function, or, or evaluate this function, or this uh, script, and let me know if the output matches what I expect it to be, right? But I had a line in there, like, don't get all fancy pants. That's a very technical way of saying, just keep it to one test for it block, if you can. Uh, because testers just gonna take all those tests and give one output. Anyone would fail. It could be somewhat challenging sometimes to figure out which test within the if block failed. So I say for each if block, just run one test. You don't have to, it'll work. And some people choose not to. I'll show you some examples. <coughs> My particular cup of tea will work right there. Uh, and then what I use is called the arrange at asserts. It's actually, I stole it from a it's very popular. Anyone heard of the this version of AAA? Not the accounting auditing thing. Okay, it's kind of a new thing. It's really just saying, and I broke it down get data, test data. Tell me what happened and make sure that it ran. And I tend to use like it and stuff, things like that. Very technical. <coughs> so it's an issue. Describe, context, and it. That's how you build these tests. They're just regular PS1 files. There's nothing special about them. You don't need any, you know, voodoo magic. You don't need to be a Jedi or anything like that. Uh, and this is kind of what a sample logical test would look like, where I've said, all right, in the first describe block, I'm going to create a group of tests to run against someone's API. You know, maybe I'm using a product in my environment that's an API. I then set the context to an old version of the API. I run all my tests for my functions. I then set the context to the new version of the API, run all my functions, and now I know they work against both of them right behind the bug. And then maybe I'm doing parameter tests, and I have that in the describe block, and so on and so forth. So it's really just a way of logically structuring uh, various functions and scripts, see that the results match what you think they should be, and pass through the pass through. It just tells you, hey, it didn't work out. 
I'm sorry, I didn't want to can't wait to go play with this. I'm gonna take, take a quick pause for you. Okay. Yeah, stop it. This is like the third one today. And no single point today. <laughs> Alright. Trying to keep the plot. So let's go through another example. And let's dive into should. Right? And should it. Again, it's one of those private functions that's used by Pester. You want to try to leave the PowerPoint for a moment? That was awesome. Oh, it's like a good joint. Mystery Man appears from the side. Mystery Man. How many more like? Oh, more oh, pizza. Oh, I just love those. There you go. I can't compete with pizza. That's not fair. That's all right. Let's go get another one. So you remember I said describe, context, and then that's the way it's Maintain your tests, which is the way to structure them, so that they're evaluated in the order that makes sense for you. Now we're going to look at should, right? And so this example, again, it's like kind of a fake example just to show you the workflow that Pester uses. We have a very simple function called example2, a very exotic name. And no matter what happens, we're just going to return a simple array of three objects, specifically a Boolean, an int, and a string. Right? So we're just going to return these three objects. Now let's look at how we can evaluate those using should. Okay. Again, let's go. So, in this case, I'm describe, I'm not using context again, I'm just saying describe, I'm going to have some tests in here, test the various objects that are within X, test the many values of X. So the first one, on lines 21 through 23, I'm doing a Boolean check, and I can say evaluate function 2, or example 2, Give me the first object in there that's zero within the array set, and that should be true. Remember, if you pass the Boolean true in there, it should be true. So I can check the Boolean value. I can look at the next object within the array, which is object number one, and I can say it should be an integer that's exactly 1337, that's the best number ever. Uh, that should be greater than the number one, and additionally, that's bad, it's top of the uh, And then the third object should match the regular expression of power, anything, and an exclamation mark. Right? So you can do regex, you can do anything you can think of, you can put with the check lines. Right? I have to run this, I'll clear this out so we don't get any bleed over. Right. And make this bigger. And very simply, we've tested all those objects. Now how does this, what does this look like? You've not seen a successful test yet, so let's go into that a little bit. Basically, it's saying, Describing and then the name that I gave the describe block, so you can be somewhat verbose with these because it's going to tell you with each hit block what's going on. Negative and red means <coughs> plus and green means happy and text. Right? So it's basically saying that for each hit block, it takes the name and it tells you how long it took to run that particular test. Right? So very simple. So you can see even if there's a funnel that in your testing. And it went through and all of these pass muster. Right? They're all good. <coughs> Verify. Right? You're all scrolling down a little bit. Like for example, the it greater than oh, see, full stuff that's not over. The greater than value check is the name here as well as there. I did have a question yesterday. Someone asked if you expand these plus signs. That would be cool, but no, they're just ASCII text. Uh, if you need to go further into it, though, I can choose how to do that. So so far, I've just been pressing F5 to evaluate the entire bit of code that I have on there. You can also run this more on demand, which is typically how you're going to run it. So let me just. Uh, So are, those also results, input. Sorry, okay. sorry, are those results paths in an array or a hash table or something? Or? That's exactly what I'm going to show you, 100%. Because that, otherwise, to the console, it's not going to do very much. Right, right. So this is just like the visual. Now let's actually do something with those results. Right, so I can do invoke Pester. And just without any arguments, it's going to look for any files with the name tests in the name. Specifically, period tests, period PS1. So it has to be at the trailing end of the name. And evaluate <coughs> And I've got a couple different ones in here, so I don't want to evaluate all of them. I just want to do this example too. Let's grab example two and run that test specifically. Okay. So there we go. Again, not too helpful, but we've run it at the command line. It's wanted to evaluate this particular piece of code, this test, and run it. What if I wanted to, as an example from the gentleman here, actually take the objects that return in a hash table and use them? Because that's really where the power is. And all I have to do is hit up to a piece of previous uh, command. I can do a pass through parameter. And then I get this big blob of stuff. And the big blob of stuff is a giant hash table, and it's telling me some very important information, such as how many tests passed, how many failed, 
as long with, along with a nested hash table with all the details of every single task. So what you can do, just everyone can see that? Okay, cool. Yeah, it's just a lot of data. And for this case, no error records exist because nothing failed, but otherwise the dollar sign error information will be thrown directly into that object. So you can then interrogate a test to see why it failed, and get the error object you know, passed along somewhere else to potentially run a debug. <coughs> if you want to actually look at that further, you can also save this to a variable. I'll go all the way back and say, you know, equals that. It didn't return to the console because I had saved it to a variable, and I have contained the <laughs> So you can go in there and you say, you know, equals something like format table, you know the different information. Right, so it's all there to be used. What I typically do with that information, is have it thrown to, I use InfluxDB to front a Grafana dashboard. So I see when my tests are running, how many were successful, it gives little bar charts and that kind of crap. You can use VMware Log Insight, Splunk, you can use anything to interrogate a JSON object or hash table object or whatever format you want to use. And so this is where you get granular. And what's neat about it is because it passes information on every single test in a granular format, you can potentially decide to do different things if different tests fail, right? So like maybe one test is testing, can I connect to a SQL database that's in your environment? Just went to the help check, like can I query it? Can I get an example table? Maybe you hide a special character within there just to make sure it's alive. And if that fails, send an email or a Slack message to my DDN. Like that's his or her problem. Does that answer your question? I'll pause there, cool. Still happy? Not that happy. I wanna see your happy. I already know this though. Back to PowerPoint, I apologize. Also, I'll see what's on the inside. There's the backup slide. Let's look at another example. So, I've talked about like an example where you want to remove Active Directory users. Does anyone like screw that up and lose stuff out of AD or something? On? Nobody no. wants to. Like, a few people are kind of like shy of raising their hand. Nobody wants to admit it. Um, I once accidentally, uh, I was managing several hundred computers for call center. I once accidentally screwed up where the asterisk was for a wildcard and deleted uh, System32 off all the machines. I mean, automation can kick your ass. It's good and bad. Okay. So I, that's why I love unit tests. Because <laughs> I am very fallible. So what if you can't use real code? What if you can't talk to an endpoint? Or what if you don't want to? Because what if only gets you so far if you use the what if parameter? That just says, I would have done something. And you're like, well, okay, but how? Because maybe I want to delete 10 users out of the And I made an error in there to delete 100. Right? So let's talk about how you can mock some of the commands so that you can emulate real life. And this is where we start getting very interesting. Because in a lot of cases, as an example with the AD users, I could go and actually grab the object that is all my AD users, just like git dash AD user, it's gonna give me everybody, store that object, throw it over to Hester and say, if I gave you all these users and I asked you to run the delete the it, what would the return look like? Now we're getting interesting. I had to get there. So we will eject that power uh, PowerPoint one more time. I will not make any questions. I had to back play one time. Just close your eyes. Uh, example number three. So this is kind of an easy peasy example where there's a function called example three. Uh, you pass it a path variable, and it will then uh, interrogate that variable by giving it to get child item and basically say, give me all the objects that live within that path. Maybe you're trying to check to make sure that certain images are in there, something like that. You want to test the logic to make sure that's working. Right? In this case, it might be a secure environment, or my testing environment has no access to that path. So I can't actually run a test on that path. Cool. We will mock it. We won't make fun of it. I mean, we could, but that's not very useful. We're going to actually mock the return value that we get. So right here, you can see, if I highlight line two, that when I give a variable or an answer to path, I should get child item for that path, right? So that should actually give me information on that path. Here in the test, though, let me scroll down. Oh, let me turn on uh, here, or uh, work back. There we go. I think this one's just a little bit too big to get all on screen, so we'll kind of walk through it. Now I've added a little bit more prettiness to make this look like a real tester test, and I've actually commented where I'm doing the arrange, the act, and the assert. So let's walk through what's going on. So the first area that you see is the arrange. This is where we're going to get data using the mock command. And mock, as it sounds like, will actually mock what would happen if I ran the command, and you can give it any arbitrary data to return. So I'm saying anytime the function that I test uses get child item, which remember that was in example three up there, instead of actually doing get child item, 
just give a return of these two file names called file1 and file2. Just a two object array, that's what's going to come back. This is where you would insert like all the AD users or what would be in production. You put that production data in here so that your function can <coughs> it's not real data. Right? So that's what's happening there. Also, I've toggled this verifiable parameter. And that means the test will fail if we don't run get child item somewhere in there. If we don't actually mock that command, this test fails. Anyone can think of why that would be a failure? It would mean that the logic isn't being respected. Because somewhere in there, my function isn't calling something that I expect it to call. I'm expecting get child item to be called, and I'm saying if it doesn't, I screwed up somewhere. The code's not good. Okay. Make sense? And the next area is the act. We're just going to do one it statement. We're going to file check. We're going to run function named example three. Give it a path of some bogus as this exists. Um, and then say it should be equal to those objects. Right? This is where you could say, delete the eight users with anyone named Chris, and I should get back a list of people that aren't Chris. Right? And then we return it to check the list. And then assert, this is a special tester function saying, make sure that every mock command that I put the um, verifiable against has been run. Because if not, I know I screwed up the lines. Excited to run this one? Control, boom, there we go. And for all that work, this is all we get back. And that kind of just proves that it's not trying to go to this like secure NAS share somewhere. It's actually returning the value that we expected because we mocked it We're forcing the return value of that particular thing. This is where I think you get a lot of power. I was talking to some folks yesterday where it was like, Oh yeah, I can do an audit, I can make sure that value matches what I expect, and it's just not going to get to. I can test it first here and then actually implement it. Or the, the delete. Like I think delete is the best case for mocking. Because uh, man, I've deleted so much stuff that I didn't mean to. Because you know, sometimes regular expressions can be can get busted, right? Uh, sometimes wildcards are a little too convenient. They don't work. Uh, or they, they work too well. They're, they're too good at the job. So does that make sense? Mocking. Sorry, flip them, flip them back one more time. I think there's only one example left. Ah, okay. That's a lot of work just to like pull up the side, pull up the troll, just looking back and forth. So what about now we've looked at you know what does it do? How do I kind of put together a pester test? I think that's just practice and experience and exposure. Makes sense. But you're probably not gonna want to sit at a command line and be like, run my tests. Run my tests. You know, like that's not too cool. What about build systems? Systems that can automatically run by. So you can get super simple and you can just literally make a build or a uh, so the script that's just called by a task manager, or sorry, a schedule task or a task scheduler. They change it every you know, really day. Uh, but you just put it in there, say run it every hour, and if there's a if there's a failure, email. Right? You can go really, really simple. Or you could do this <coughs> that will totally let you just pick up and put your feet on, a, on a, in the sand, or a corn area, or a corona line, or a little bit. And those are build systems. Right? And I'm going to go through one that I recommend using today. It's totally free, and I use it all the time, and I love it. No way affiliated to at Bear that I have there, but I think it's cool. I think you'll enjoy uh, consuming it. Plus, you, if you get this stuff set up and none of your team has seen it before, you will be like, so killer ninja, like, oh my gosh. It'll blow your mind. So I'll show you how that works. The deck will be given to the slug folks, so don't worry about like screenshotting or taking photos and stuff. I'll make sure you get the links. What I have here is a project that we're going to go through really quick that's using at Bear so you can see it. And then a blog post that I wrote that goes like 2,000 words into it. It's pretty crazy. Ready? I'm going to switch out here.
So AppBear is the product that we both use, and essentially it watches anything you want. In this case, it's watching this GitHub repository, which is just a folder in someone else's server, basically. And whenever a change is proposed to the environment, if someone's like, oh, I want to make a change to your code, it runs through all of its tests to make sure that nothing is broken. Right? AppBear is just something that you literally go sign up for and point it at your GitHub or your Bitbucket or whatever it is that you're using for managing code. And it runs all these tests automatically any, anytime someone proposes changes, which is called a pull request. Right? And so, remember I said this guy likes tests? This guy likes tests. Those are all tests. Look at all those tests. It goes on for a while. I'm going to keep going. Uh, we're almost there. There we go. 498 tests are executed. And someone, like, that's a, that's a little bit on the high side. <laughs> I don't expect you to write it. But essentially, uh, what he's done is he's written maybe you know, 30 or 40 tests, and it goes through every single file and checks them by changing context. So there's not that many tests that he's written. It's just kind of looping through each file to make sure the script analyzer is being run, and that he likes the formatting, and that it's doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, and obviously, you could not do this with your meat scheduling. There's no way that's going to work. Uh, and at bear actually runs all these tests on his behalf, and at the end says, you can't see it because it's in the black part to build success. Everything's good. So that when a change is proposed, he just lets this run, and it took 107 seconds, so two minutes, went through almost 500 tests, and it quit, and came back and said, yeah, from the perspective of Pester, everything's great. You might want to eyeball check it for sanity, but this is good. You should be able to go ahead and accept the proposed changes and merge them into your code. And what I typically do is every time someone finds a bug, I call them the banana bug. Well, you haven't heard that it's a personal thing. So I used to write a lot of code for, uh, for several companies. And I had this one guy who I hated, is he would always put the most weird inputs he could into all my code. Specifically banana. Like if I wanted to hit or something like that, like I put a banana in there and the code blew up. It's like, no, it's expecting number two. So he would throw banana tests at me. So you could put your banana tests in here and just say, what if I put some weird number in it? Now I just learned to write all of my validations in reverse. So I'm like, if it's not what I'm expecting, throw an error. I used to say, like, if it is what I'm expecting, continue. And it was just like, what do I do if it's not? Um, so temp write your logic in reverse. That helps with the banana guys. <laughs> so these tests are automatically run and done for you. And because the system is already using a framework you're familiar with, you can write the tester tests. It can be used by app data. It can be used by you. It can be used by whatever. Right? So this is just, they work in tandem. There's no rework there. It's kind of cool, right? Uh, so how do we recommend that? The reason I switched to show you because I just love that the guy writes 500 tests. This just doesn't do it justice. You have to literally see the scrolling before it. It's great. Um, cool. So that's the techie demoy part. Now we come to the been doing this for a couple years. Here's the wisdom and things that I wish I could have told myself two years ago to kick my own butt. Um, some random thoughts here. The first one is uh, keep your functions really small, <coughs> especially when you start to do test. If you have like, I used to write these scripts that would be several hundred lines and just watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it. And try to test that, it's not possible. It's not going to work. Right? So try to actually turn that into a function. And anytime you have logic statements, break those out into sub right? Try to keep your functions very small. One input is one output. It's really easy to test that. It's very hard to break that. So that's, that's a recommendation that I have. Um, unit test those functions rather than that entire long workload. Because if you've broken everything into little functions, and you're unit testing all those little functions, and you've already got all what's called code coverage on that particular script, right? If you know all those things are going to work fine, then all you're really testing past that point is functional testing to make sure that, yeah, everything past unit test and that the logic is good, so let's make sure this work well with this. Okay, so that's another piece of advice. I also, if you can stand it, it takes the right kind of like personality. I'm not, I'm not sure everyone can do it. Uh, TDE, people heard of test driven development. It's where you write the test first, and then you write the code to make sure that, uh, until the test passes. The cool thing about that is I am I am a procrastinator to no one no one's business. I wrote this whole deck like on Monday. Okay? It's just like a rain dump that I came up with. If you write the test first, guess what? You always have a test. It's there. Right? You, you wrote it. I'm really bad about writing some code because I need to, and it's like hurry, hurry, hurry. And then I forget, or I just I'm like, eh, test, and I'll test later. Uh, so if you go that route, it'll just kind of handle stuff for you. Uh, anytime someone submits a bug or like, hey, when I put in banana, it explodes. Write a test for that. Find banana test. You know, write like banana test. Uh, so before you fix the bug, write the test to make sure that it never happened again. Actually, write that test to make, to reproduce the bug, 
make the test a permanent part of your testing structure for unit testing, then fix it, and then if you ever screw it up and break it again, you have the unit test, it will find that problem. Right? So you, you have like tribal knowledge that you've now put into a test and it's no longer technology. And the last one is be nice to yourself. Uh, just as an example from commit script, I don't know how many times I've written <coughs> crappy code because I was lazy or I didn't test it, and then the person that gets burned is me. Right? So that's like, he's going back in time to kick his own ass for not writing good code. So that's happened to me so many times. And it just, you know, eventually you, you, you lose, you know, your meat spatulas are, are wounded and scarred when you don't have to do it. Got two other things. One, resources. Right? So Pester is kind of like that. Uh, it's on GitHub. It's natively installed on any latest Windows uh, build. You can get it off of the gallery or GitHub if you want. Two books that I really like. The Pester book. Um, that's written by Adam Bertram. He's like the Pester godfather. He's like, oh, you know, on the day my daughter's working, I make a Pester function. <laughs> that's really bad time. I'm a sucker. So. <laughs> uh, he's actually writing it on LeanPub, which is cool because it's not using one of those big book distributors that take all the money. I wrote a book. It doesn't make a squat for money. I even donated all the charity. And I'm like, I'm sorry that this donation is so small, but the publisher took all the money. Um, so he's writing on LeanPub, it's 30 bucks for the book, I think he gets like 26 of the dollars. But this is just like in his spare time, he's kind of brain dumping, very long and detailed. The suggested price is 50, whatever you can go with in there, obviously budgets are, are what they are. But a uh, great guy, and he writes a lot of stuff for free, I would support him if you can, if you're interested in the um, We also at the Powerful Summit last week did Lightning Summits, uh, Lightning Demos rather. Those are all recorded on this kid help from Rambling Cookie Monster, aka PowerShell Cookie Monster, aka Warren Frame. Uh, so he's got all those on there. And then last, if you're just like, man, I got 50 hours to burn, and I like super deep books to talk about testing, which is me. Uh, the next unit test patterns, refactoring test code. What I like about this book is it tells you all the language that, like, there's people that their life is testing. Like, that's what they do. I'm not one of them, but I can appreciate that. So you learn their language, kind of the theory, you know, the logical flows that they're going with. This will save you so much like learning time. You just be like, oh, this is how you do it. And we'll teach about stubbing and double stubbing and you know explicit mocking and all these little things. <coughs> and then finally, three people I recommend trailing on the interwebs. Uh, Chris Hunt is logical diagram. He is probably one of the best mocking people that I know. He actually had a session at the at the summit that was uh, mock me all you want. You know, this is just, doesn't take tells you itself too seriously. Uh, but he's great if you want to learn about mocking and when to mock and how to mock. How to keep the mocks as close to the data as possible, so you're not going mocking everything. Great guy. Adam Bertram, I talked about a little earlier. He is the tester godfather. He's written so much stuff on his blog, and he's just uh, A.D. Bertram on Twitter. And then Jeffrey Snover. Jay Snover. Um, interesting aside, does anyone know the story of, of Jeff Snover and Interesting, interesting thing. So, you all know that Windows didn't have a shell like, for a long time, right? Basics. A batch, or JavaScript, MediaScript, or you better borrow from everybody else's language. Uh, he wrote in 2001 a manifesto uh, called the Monad Manifesto. He's like, we really need a shell at Microsoft. He was working on it. We really need a shell. And they were like, you're stupid. We already have one. It's called DOS. He's like, no, it's not a shell. Um, so he wrote the manifesto, and he was really serious about writing power. He's got to do this. And his boss is going, that's a dumb idea. No. But if you want to do it, you're going to take a pay cut. You're gonna have a lower title, like we're gonna put you like in Milton's storage B with the red swing line. And you can go do this, but no one cares about you. And he's like, well, I'm really, really passionate about this. He wouldn't get it. Five years later, he's a distinguished engineer running this little thing called Windows Server Division from Microsoft, <laughs> making, I'm assuming, lots more money. Right? You, don't, you don't run Windows Server and make no money. Uh, and he's one of the principal architects for Microsoft. You know, that was roughly five years later that he did that. So, um, I, I went up to him, I'm like, did you just rub that right in the face? Oh, you know, I told you so. He's like, no, no. I'm just, I'm very happy to give you guys and gals the tool to finally not suck. <laughs> like, I appreciate that. <coughs> so I'm going to pause it there. I'd like to show you one other cool project, but it depends on how many people raise their hand when I ask you. Know, VMware in your environment. Everybody. OK, cool. That's easy. I'll show you one more project that just might blow your mind a little bit that uses Pester. It's called Vester, because it's Pester, it's the VMware. You know, I don't like naming things. That's my only example, for example. So I'll show you that project. So I'll run through a really super quick demo, and then I'll take questions. <coughs> I don't know if you've been telling this at 45 minutes. I apologize. I'll let it go. 
Let's just get right into it. Keep going. There it is, Vesper. So if you go to Walnut Work on GitHub and look up Vesper, this is a project that takes the entire vSphere infrastructure and distills it down to a configuration file. So think like your vCenter config, all your clusters, your data center, your DRS, your HA, how your VMs should be configured from like a you know, CD-ROM to snapshots. And if you want to do hardening, vSphere 6.5 hardening guide, all that kind of stuff, that blah, blah, blah. So go to your environment, go grab all that, and we'll make a configuration file out of that. And then you can make edits depending on what you want things to be. Like if you want DRS to be fully automated instead of parsed down, et cetera. And then Vester will make sure that those values are reality within this year. So if someone goes and makes a change and like turns off HA, this will go and say, well, someone turned off HA. I just want you to know. And it can fix it if you want that to happen. Does that sound cool? I'll go quick and show you how it works. So just grab the touch of Vester. And we use the old school, the old school PowerShell IC. So, uh, so let's actually import back here. It requires PowerShell CLI, the VMware module for PowerShell. Uh, but if you import Vester, as you can see, it automatically uh, imports all the VMware stuff as well. Uh, if you don't have it, it'll just snag and say, oh, yeah, that's all PowerShell. So just for the sake of brevity, I went ahead and created a configuration file. It's just so big I can't see it. There it is. And you'll notice the config file is just like, hey, vCenter, you know, what does that look like? What does the scope look like? Like, what am I actually going to be testing in the environment? In this case, everything is an asterisk wildcard just saying everything. Uh, what are my clusters supposed to look like? HA should be enabled for that particular cluster. What's DRS supposed to look like? What the host? And there's tons and tons of values in there. And that's all pulled out of the environment using new Vesper config. That's part of the mod. So that built that. It just takes a while over my cell phone back at San Clara, so I want to do it. <coughs> and then, what we can do is actually test that. So let's connect him to vCenter. Let's do it. I'm not DNS on this thing, so I just had to remember what my Oh my May or may not be 13 circles. But then you cool get like a like emoji passwords. <laughs> heart, heart, cactus. I, I feel like at some point security is going to require that. Like it has to be a color, four emojis, a math equation. There you go. So now we're connected. And if I didn't connect, it would nag me. Um, and I'm in the best folder. You could run from anywhere. Just uh, to tell what test to run. Just as a quick like, where are the tests at? Uh, they're in a full test. Yeah. See, there's tests for the cluster, the uh, data store cluster, host, network based on the tests are all located there. These are all contributed by the community. People write these tests and then contribute them. So if you're missing a test, you're like, ah, oh, missing whatever. Uh, writing a test requires a two line of code. It's very simple. You abstract away all of it. All you have to do is tell us what your test is. So that's how it works. So let's go back real quick and show you. And just kind of let it run for a little bit. And what it's doing is actually using Pester to run unit tests against the environment. So it's saying like, hey, is DRS enabled? Well, I checked the cluster, demo, that's cool. I checked the cluster for the DRS automation level, that's cool. Like, all these things are good, okay? And if there were an issue, it would come back. Let's actually cause an issue real quick. Let's look for example. Uh, I think cluster's called demo. Yeah, because yeah, it says right there, of course. Okay. So let's take demo, which is set to, uh, sorry for the word back, fully automated. Let's break that. Let's set Oscar address to parsley on here. Just ask me, am I sure? Are we sure? Can we do it? It's a live system and it's real. <laughs> oh, no, nobody can really expect any sanity in it. And there we go. Now, the RS is set to parsley on here. That's what it's saying. It's just good enough screen. So now, if you're on best here, it should notice that, right? Because I told it in the config, fully automated, buddy. But maybe I was doing you know, some kind of test or fixing something and I just forgot. That's typically what it is. It's not, it's, not, it's not malice, it's just tired. We'll be tired. So we're going to invoke that to test uh, again. And wait until it hits. I think the second test is going to look for the level. And it's just going to throw red text everywhere. It's so pissed. Boom. It's not there. So it's saying, you know, sorry for the word wrap. Basically saying, I expected it to be fully automated, but it's partially automated. You can go manually fix it if you wanted. I have this just run every hour. Uh, but more importantly, I'm. What's that last bullet item? Like what I am? Lazy, want to do less work. So let's just invoke Vester and add the fly. 
<laughs> and now it's going to go through. And anytime it finds that the VMware environment differs from the configuration file, it's going to fix it. I'll tell you that it fixed it too. Uh, at the very end, I let it run. It would take forever to run over cell phone. So, uh, so now we're taking the DRS level. It's going to actually pull it. And now because we have remediate turned on, it's like, oh, that's not correct. Let me go fix it. Run some tests again. It says, cool, it's good now. Um, so you can run that in your environment. Like, you can test every hour. You can turn off certain tests. Literally, if you just delete a test, it won't run, or just delete the config out of the environment. It won't run. It just runs wherever you want. Uh, you can make a config for like prod, and then for dev, and, you know, for site A, site B, however you want to flow. And totally free. If you did it, it's basically using like DSC almost, right? It's like DSC, except you don't have to install anything. Yeah. And you don't have to learn DSC. <laughs> so it's like, sort of. <laughs> I get that a lot. People are like, why not use blah, 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 blah. Like, well, two reasons. One, I'm like a consultant. You can't install something anywhere. Right? So this is kind of cool for ad hoc. But more importantly, I hate the heaviness of VSC. It's like, oh, my pull server, my push server, my this other server. And then you have still have to write the test. The like, VMware hasn't written any test for VSC in Microsoft. So even if you're defining things in there, you can use uh, these for VSC, which is an like open source community edition of it. But it's very rough still. So just run this. Yeah, same, same idea. Okay, I'll leave it there for a moment. Questions? No questions. That's okay. I don't get paid on questions out here. That means you just give it here. He's the best. I'll put up one thing so you can see how you're holding this. Yeah. Come on, PowerPoint. Damn, that's me. You can email. Hit me up. Anything. Otherwise, thank you so much. Have a good day.